am very happy to introduce today's uh, keynote speaker. It is a very special situation for me since we have the same alma mater and we were PhD students in the same institute. I remember that we were PhD students together, but we clarified this morning that actually there are some months between, so, um, okay. Uh, Larike Bronkhorst is an assistant professor at the Department of Education of Utrecht University. Her research focuses on learning, development and collaboration across contexts. She and her research group uh, use a boundary crossing perspective in their studies and are currently carrying out an exciting ERC grant related to young people's transitions. Larike co-supervises several PhD students related to this project. Larike Bronkhorst and her close colleague Sanne Ackermann were awarded the Outstanding Publication Award at the early 2017 conference. This is a very interesting paper. And um, today's uh, keynote uh, lecture, uh, Larike will talk more about this and also related research what has followed up since 2017. So, please join me to welcome Larike. Hi, thank you all for being here. Since uh, Ellie already introduced me, I'm going to start right ahead. What you see on the picture behind me is a boundary that my daughter drew on the beach just a week ago. Some of you might also come from recent holidays. And in the part that you see in the middle, where she's standing, there was a different dynamic happening. She had created a different type of practice, where a school-like dynamic emerged that has been coming into our house and in our family for the past year since she's been attending education. There were rules that were going on there. She kept referring to, guys, we need to collaborate. If we do this together, it will happen quickly. All things that I don't recall myself saying, actually, to her that often, but I do recall from school before. I hope in this presentation it will become clearer why I took this picture to visualize how school and how boundaries and how practices can be everywhere and can be different for some than others. Also, I chose this picture because Sana, who I also listed, can't be here. She's actually on holiday. And Sana and I started this project, the one that got the publication and the award together. It was funded by NWO back in 2013, I think. We moved to Leiden University a while back, and we moved back to Utrecht University again. So it's actually a pity that she couldn't be here. She sent me a postcard reflecting uh, the holiday, so, uh, but most of the work is together. So uh, when I say I, I often mean we, and when I say we, I often mean Salna and others uh, participating in the work. Okay. Let me start by telling what I will tell you during this um, session. Namely, that connecting to out-of-school participation promotes students' learning. Um, and this is learning in a broad sense. So I do refer to students' learning, so those that participate in formal education, but I don't only mean learning here that is uh, validate, validated in education. And what I mean with connecting and out-of-school, I hope, will become clear during the presentation. Let me also start by saying that this won't be the only thing, so I hope to build on this argument and end with a more nuanced or elaborated argument that hopefully gives more puzzled faces, because I seem to see some recognition with this statement. And of course, that's not the intention. I hope you um, are provoked in some ways. Okay, sorry, not touch the hair. Okay, so, we all know that learning doesn't stop when we leave school. There's this whole tradition of learning that's in other settings. It goes by different names, informal, authentic, unintended, professional, online. And in what I discuss, I think we refer to all of those as out of school, so not in school. They are different, of course, in many respects, these traditions, but they share in a way that they're, well, in school, learning is intended. You have a novice that you hopefully hope becomes an expert. 
In out of school, generally, we see that learning takes place in a less linear, less vertical way. Um, although these two traditions often operate separately, uh, seeing those two traditions together for Sana and I raised a lot of questions. If you know that children also learn math out of school, the famous article about the street vendors, what can you say about who is actually learning in general? You could also ask questions about where learning takes place. It could be everywhere. And recently, a lot of questions have been asked about what we should learn. What are these 21st century skills that we need or that we want? And it has been argued that children learn a lot of those skills actually outside of formal education. Okay, just a few of the questions. Not the main focus of the talk, though. If you look at these two lines of research, and we say two now, but there are multiple, you could ask more questions, and they have been asked. Namely, if students learn in school, what do they take with this from out of school? Or alternatively, what do children take from what they learn at home or in their work to school? And this linear transfer model has been criticized as it seems to assume that knowledge transfers, and that knowledge tastes the same, and that the transfer is one-directional. Whereas in daily life, we know that knowledge it doesn't tra transfer, and an individual transitions. We know that in, in different practices, what you know has different meaning, and you know that we uh, transition on a daily basis between practices. So maybe it looks more like this. To give an example, maybe that you know on this conference you participate maybe in different SIGs that maybe have different ways of doing things, and you move between presentations, and sometimes you feel the discourse is different than you're used to, sometimes you feel at home, but you move back and forth. This also happens for children, at least, on a daily basis. They go from home to school, they meet their friends in school, they have breaks, they check their phone often, of course, giving inside to way new practices, then they have hobbies, they might have clubs, they might have online participations. So they move between these practices on a daily basis. And we are actually interested in the connection. So are learning processes extended, or are some really isolated to one of those participations? Based on own experience, you would expect some extended uh, learning processes. So that's our fascination, that's what triggered this whole um, research in the beginning, and the article. If you look at the literature, you see contradictory findings. So you see uh, different domains of research where they emphasize connections. So they emphasize that what children learn at home, or what they learn in online environments, um, actually has a lot of potential for what you can do in education. So there are funds of knowledge or islands of expertise that teachers can use in their education. Uh, also more ecological perspective, stressing how actually what children learn and participate in is located in a variety of settings. Wait. Yeah. Can you still hear me? No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, learning lives is another um, metaphor, connected learning. Oh. I hear myself completely different now, so I have to get used to that. Okay, but on the other hand, you also see a lot of literature where the connection is actually uh, stressed that it doesn't take place. They're isolated, school remains isolated as a participation. The article by Fallon and colleagues is one of the first that really shows how for some students, school is actually so different that they feel they don't belong, and they get this message on a daily basis that they should behave, act, uh, and so different than they are used to, that school becomes something so alien that they don't know how they can continue. So, the same phenomenon, but widely different findings across different fields of literature. Okay, so this was our interest. How can this be? And what we think is a, uh, a nice theoretical perspective that also explains partly these contradictory findings is that of boundary crossing, as uh, Ellie already mentioned. So, boundary crossing. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. I will give our interpretation and explanation of this uh, 
perspective. So boundary crossing emphasizes how on the one hand, uh, on a different one level, you have school as a practice. It is culturally and historically informed and structured in such a way with a distinct purpose of educating people. In this practice, you have a certain rhythm, you often have assessments, you have often teachers, so it's, it's, you can see how it's a uh, practice that has a different purpose, different way of doing, relating. On the other hand, you have, for instance, home as a practice. He, also, there's time, also there are people, of course, but the way you are uh, um, relating and acting is completely is different. So you can look at the practices at that level and identify how they are similar or how they are different. But on a lower level, on a different within nested, there's an individual who is participating in these practices and who can make or cannot make connections. And this individual does not participate only in in and out of school, or, but in different practices, which all have different social cultural history and ways of doing now. From a boundary crossing perspective, next to these similarities and differences on a system level, you can also look at continuities and discontinuities that individuals experience when they go with, across those sites. So even though practices are different, people can still link them. So I think your phone is a nice example. With, from your phone that you are holding now and you are listening or not listening to a talk at a conference, your personal life can come in and you, cannot, you don't really experience discontinuity. It's a fluent process or fluent. Your participation here is not listed. Okay, so this is our perspective. And using this perspective and the contradictory literature, we uh, tried to answer this research question, so when actually do students experience continuity and when is it more of discontinuity? And we thought, given the fact that there's already a lot of literature devoted to this topic, phenomenon, um, a literature review might be a nice first step to really look across all these scattered fields of research and try to synthesize them. In the remainder of the talk, when you see the symbol of the books, for lack of better symbol, I will be referring to results of the literature review. But we concluded that literature review already some few years back. It was published in 2016, as you can see. And we had some, of course, as always, recommendations for further research. And when you see the symbol of the eyeglass, uh, that symbol, uh, then I will refer to later research that we conducted, try to really uh, build on the findings that we had and maybe try to also uh, work on some of the things that we thought deserved more attention. So you will see those in the presentation or well, I try to integrate them for a more coherent story. Okay. Uh, I just want to mention this briefly. We started with a systematic review. You can give it different names, maybe a, a synthesis or a meta-ethnography. Meta uh, we did two searches, purposefully, one with boundary crossing and school, because those, boundary crossing and synonyms, because those are articles that already look at the phenomenon of transitions or boundary crossing and school, and a body of literature that doesn't look at it from that perspective, but merely studies in and out of school in a more empirical sense, because we didn't want to only per, um, look at literature that already adopts a boundary crossing perspective. Uh, from all these hits, we tried to deduce from the abstract if learning them more in more than formal education was studied in an empirical way. And we tried to adhere to the study's definition of learning. So learning could be uh, learning gains, standardized scores, but it could also be progressive participation, identity development, anything that the authors define as learning, we tried to include. And then we ended up with 186 articles that we thought were interesting to, uh, were relevant to this phenomenon. Uh, and then the analysis, this is something that we often get questions about, so I tried to uh, say something about it. But what we um, um, did was that we tried to include all studies, even they use different measures. So for instance, we had some studies that really looked at an individual student, often case studies of only a few um, students. And for instance, they're uh, learning about um, democracy, they're learning about um, also uh, controversial topics, and they really traced these students with ethnographies how this understanding came to be. 
There were also studies that used large aggregate data sets where they tried to analyze if students after a summer holiday had more uh, students with different backgrounds had different types of achievements. So if actually the summer, where you could say out of school is taking place, had an impact in a lasting sense. Uh, we had studies looking for what teachers find challenging in connecting to out of school. We had studies where, that concerned where uh, parents find it challenging. So anything actually was uh, included to try to give an overview of the phenomena and not a part of it. You can decide for yourself if we uh, succeeded in that respect. Okay, so the findings. I think it falls five parts. Uh, first, we try to define what is school. Um, an easy thing, of course. Um, joking. Uh, then there are four phenomena that we see, and I will go through them step by step. Yeah, let me see uh, if this works. Somewhat naively before um, beginning the review, we had thought that each article would give a somewhat clear definition of what is school and what is school is not. We had assumed that it was a multifaceted practice, as I just started with all the circles. But after reviewing all the literature, we have felt the need to define it more clearly. And I will now present what may be an obvious list, but what helps us in seeing what is school and what is not school. Uh, in these studies. So typically, in the studies, school is a place where learning is intended, a certain type of learning and a certain type of learning outcome, where teachers are the knowledgeable actors and students are those that listen to these actors, where what they learn, how they learn, and in what rhythm is formalized in a curriculum, irrespective of what is the content of the curriculum, um, where learning, what learning is done by, is validated by assessment, irregardless of what kind of assessment. Where there's cumulative qualification, so uh, succeeding one type of education builds on the next. Where there's a school building, and where school is mandatory to attend. These last two might seem trivial, or the building or the site of school as a distinguishing feature has often been criticized, but actually for students it makes a lot of difference uh, where school takes place and if they have to attend. And then out of school was actually where one of these characteristics does not seem to apply. So in the studies we had uh, instances where, as some of you might saw, in a school building, in a school setting, someone is here and is doing something that you would not expect, so the exercises. We had uh, informal music. We had, um, but we also had studies where only the building was different. So, uh, yeah. And what this means for us, I guess, is that school is not this typical version and that what school means is different in every setting. So for some settings, out of school might be something that's only changed in a little respect, maybe because a teacher is not a teacher, but someone from a community practice. And in other out of school situations, Students were no longer referred to as students, but children, and they participated in a practice of doing science. I'll try to illustrate why this matters, with an example from our own research afterwards. Ah, I wanted to say something before. Uh, what you also saw in the reviewed studies is how people look at school and how they understand school can be very different. So there was a beautiful out-of-school project that the authors were really proud of, but one of the students in that project kept referring to that out-of-school, beautiful hybrid, as a class. And they were really frustrated with that. We can understand it analytically, because what students had to do and how they were expected to behave actually resembles school. So large differences between what actors consider school, and also how that changes over time. There was a nice study about the use of a Facebook group, where the teachers really intended to uh, use the more informal dynamic of Facebook to have students interact in English together, but where you can see in the early phases that students really looked at the teacher to look what they were, had to do. So a school-like dynamic changing over time. Okay, so first of our, one of our own projects, it's a summer school, a four-day program at our university where students uh, get acquainted with science. And the idea is 
uh, that they stimulate in Dutch the wetenschapswijsheid, so the scientific wit or the attitude to science. It's during the summer holiday at the university, and university teachers and students volunteer. And most children participate voluntarily or because their parents encourage them to do so because they have to work. Often you see that a lot of our children, your children, are going to such a program because we want to finish some work, some scientific work. What is really nice about this program, we thought, and why we think it's nice to include this next to all the studies that already have been published, is that this program deliberately also invites children with what they call distance to science to participate. So they ask certain schools in Utrecht that have a different demographic, a lower SES or a different culture, to nominate, or they ask the teachers to nominate children who would like to, but are not likely to come into contact with science. So we thought this is nice, because in many of the reviewed studies, uh, these two groups are separated. Okay, this is a picture of what's going on there. And in some respects, you could say, oh, this is school, right? You see the children, they have their papers, they have their badges, they're looking at assignments. And in some other ways, you could say, hey, but there's a cow, they're touching it. Not often that you see a cow in school, in a school building at least. Um, and some children seem to have lost their papers. Uh, also a feature of that happens out of school more often. So, and here you could see that on a, it matters per child what is school and what is out of school, but it's also important to try to take into account what it is, we thought at least. Okay, I'll try to get back to why this is important, as you can read about how this differs from out of school. But this is, we think, a way to um, make clear in studies what we actually refer to with school and how out of school is different in a more systematic way to be able to compare better across studies. Uh, yeah. So, what we concluded first is that school is not only a multifaceted practice, which we could uh, identify up front, but it's also continuously redefined in light of what is out of school. First finding. Second, if we look at students and all their practices, we see that actors report connections between contexts. So here we see the same image, and you see the borders be uh, between the practices are actually not that present. And you saw these types of connections in two different ways. Studies that were actually examining if students engage in similar activities and different practices. So if students were doing music in school um, and also doing music out of school, and if they had higher grades. But you would also have smaller scale studies, typically, that look at an understanding of a certain topic, and to see and to really trace where this understanding stems from. So, for instance, a certain perspective on society, or a certain perspective on uh, HIV, and to trace where this perspective emerged from, and how it was more than school. These connections seemed effortless, contrary to how we talk about in and out of school. In these studies, the distinction and the connection was there, the distinction wasn't prominent. These uh, is often reported with studies with an ecological framework, so for instance, Barron's um, uh, work, or as a surprising finding. One of the nice surprising findings was an after-school program focused on understanding magnetism, where a child had a story about how if the, the fridge was on or off, it changed the magnets and their functioning, whereas this was not something they had wanted to share with the children, and this was not the way they wanted children to understand. When do you see this, this continuity, these ongoing learning processes, where practices are similar? or when the student appears to be very competent in boundary crossing. Um, okay, so, so what? Well, what you see across the studies is that it's, it's actually, it, it, um, it helps, it benefits learning, my first statement. You see higher learning gains on, gains on standardized tests, on uh, really open-ended qualitative um, um, Discourse analysis, across the board you see that learning is enriched. So it's positive when these connections can be made. But, as I just said, the outcomes can be unexpected. And maybe even undesirable. 
So, of course, we were triggered by this and we thought, oh, it's always nice when you hear something you don't expect. So, we went back to the summer school program, or actually, this finding was before, but we now go back to the summer school program. And there we asked two boys of relatively the same age, but different schools and different sociocultural backgrounds, about their understanding of research before the program started. And we were really interested in what kind of connections do they make automatically. So here we have Noah, and Noah could be one of your kids, I guess, if you see the quotes. So this is what we asked, I'll let you read. So Noah, is a, he said, well, my mom also does this, this questioning, and then she writes articles about it. So yeah, I know about science. Not the science that they were going to learn in this program, but okay. So this is a connection that he made, and that if he wouldn't ask, we wouldn't know as teachers or as educators, because it's not something that they start with in the program. On the other hand, Eitan is one of the students who is invited to participate. So his school teachers said that although his parents are very encouraging, they were not very likely to have him come into contact with science, they thought. So this is his response. So for him, science is more about engineering and putting things together, which he did with his grandfather. So he sees more connections than we would expect. And for him, science is also looking things up and not being uh, satisfied when you don't find the answer. He did refer to dictionaries, so it might be a different understanding than we have. But this is what he thought was science, and this is what he expected to be learned more about during this program. Just to see how connections can be unique and unexpected. Okay, I'll go on to more of our more recent research. So, in a, one of the more recent studies, we ask adolescents to report on their daily interest engagement using a smartphone app. So, on Sunday, they've all installed this app, voluntarily with all these things. On Sunday, we ask them to uh, report what are things that you enjoy spending time on and that you like doing, maybe know more about, would like to develop more. So, their interests, we refer to them. So you can think for yourself, what are things that you like to spend time on? Life-wide, there are no restrictions, and adolescents self-define, because we are interested in those unique connections. We also ask them with whom they um, uh, like to uh, frequently interact, or with who they uh, value to interact. So not frequently, but they do value a lot. And then throughout the next week, we ask them to report every two hours with which of those interests did you engage. So did you do anything with one of those objects of interest, and why? Or we asked them to elaborate why it was interesting. And we now looked at not only the unique connections, but also the unique connections in relation to school. So every individual of those 44 has different things they like to spend time on, and they are developing expertise on, so what we would call learning. And we would like to know, without them asking, how many times the school feature in those interests? Is there anyone who would like to give a dare to estimate how often school comes back in those self-defined interests? Sorry? 10%. Okay. Nice. Anyone else? Zero. Okay. Of course, we looked at it in a more qualitative way. I didn't ask for a percent, but I will get back to this. Okay, so what you then get, we make these sort of diagrams. It's from a different article that's just been submitted. Here, the student actually, on Sunday, identified school as something he enjoys to spend time on, on Sunday already. So this is his interest. And this was not the only student that said so. So school is something that students like to spend time on and is connected to what they prefer doing. So here you see the timestamp, 
and you see it's on multiple waves, so it's multiple occasions that they en engaged with school and that they thought it was interesting. Here you see their description, his description in this case, of what he was doing. So very different things. It's not just one thing of school that he likes, but different classes, different teachers, different sessions. The break, also important. And here you see why the student thought it was interesting. And here you often also see, not in these short ex excerpts, what they learned from these engagements. I probably need to give you more time to read this, I'm not sure. Okay, I will. For all but one adolescent, school featured in these interest reports. So school was very prominently in their life, and in the life that they considered to be interesting. We thought that was at least somewhat surprising. So then we tried to examine, so what is this? How is school present in these interest reports, and in what ways? And then you have three ways across individual connections. So each individual connection is unique, but there is some systematicity into what is connected or how. First, when it's part of the curriculum. So students that have an interest in reading, reading, of course, is a part of school, tend to make a connection more easily, and school tends to feature more often. Also, when sports, uh, as soon as sport is in a, a physical exercise class, it features. Field trips are often very interesting, of course. So uh, it was interesting to read Hunger Games in English this time. So just part of the regular activity. It's not that different. Here you see social pract cultural practices might be very similar. Also things that are part of the broader practice of school, like socializing, feature a lot in the data. So then it might not be school, the curriculum that they find interesting, but the chance to talk to their fellow students about things that they find interesting. And for some students, I think it was five in total, the picture is different and from the numbers suggest, school was actually a mere alternation of some things that they find more interesting, and they used their other interests to uh, really um, process what school had demanded of them. But so, yeah, all connections are unique, but some connections seem to be more plausible than others. And we're still looking at, so what happens, what are the differences between students, and what is the differences between what schools do? Okay, given continuity, actors report a substantial or yet slash often surprising connection between context, between school and out of school. Moving on to the opposite. Actors reporting a lack of connection. This is actually also very visible in the literature, sometimes even in the same studies for the same individual student, but often for different individual students. School remains an isolated participation, and as a result, students are disengaged, disidentify with school, but also disidentify as being a learner, disidentify as someone that is smart or actually able to do school, and drop out in some cases. So Fallon, this is the study I referred to earlier, is that said that when border crossing is attempted, it is so painful that these students develop rationales and reasons to protect themselves. So there was one of the studies, whereas when you ask the student about what do you like about science, he didn't say, I don't like science anymore, but science is not my thing, I'm not really equipped. So he had really this whole uh, reasoning had become part of himself and of his identity, which is very difficult to then uh, change. Oh, yeah. You see that the student is the only one that moves between practices in the... Yeah. Okay. So this situation is reported uh, in passing for many students, but as a structural given for students that are, could be uh, or are labeled as non-mainstream, so at risk, low SES, different cultural background, minority, but also talented. And I think what we can say is that across the board this is a thing that happens for most that are non-mainstream students. But also in programs where the out of school in, uh, in the shape of an internship is part of the program, so in dual educational or vocational programs. You also see that in many cases students experience discontinuity structurally. Um, and you could say that there are large social cultural differences between practices and the student is the only actor that crosses or interacts. Maybe more importantly, at least in the literature of students with um, 
non-mainstream background. The teachers often don't know what the background of the students is, so they don't know how they can tap into that background. So teachers really struggle with this. They also recognize that they are unable to connect to students as well as to, uh, to some students as they are to others. Um, okay, this is, I know, a little bit of a depressing image. Uh, so I'll alternate with a study that we did for um, um, professional programs to see, but can programs make a difference? Does it matter what programs do if this uh, discontinuity? It's something recent that a master's student just uh, finished. We looked at uh, how students experience work, school work transitions in part-time programs. So what is nice about part-time programs is that the out-of-school component is not part of the program. So uh, the part-time program often gets students from a variety of different work settings, and they have to deal with that in their curriculum. So the students are at school for one day, and often they work in a professional way in four, four days a week and they are ex well, expected to behave differently. I think uh, some of you might have started a PhD later in life, and you know that as a professional, you're sometimes differently addressed than as a PhD, well, those sort of things. Um, we used the large-scale questionnaire because we wanted to see how programs actually differ, and we compared over 600, 600 part-time programs based on questions less, uh, concerning the rate of your professional program, program to professional practice and we saw uh, differences with the significant effect size, or effect size that is relevant, you could say. But when we look at the programs, we did a follow-up qualitative study, you see the same things that we saw in the literature. So there is something that programs can do, which is the hopeful thing. And now we'll move on to that. But first, to conclude, specific actors actually face a lack of connections, which has severe consequences. Intended discontinuity. Actors deliberately seek to connect contexts. This was nice because here in this um, understanding of what's happening, two different uh, types of research um, came together. So one type of domain of research was that the out of school is actually richer, so often authentic or informal education initiatives, where they sought to enrich school life, but also uh, a whole domain of research where school is claimed to be unresponsive, so a different type of domain, with the same outcome, namely that school needs to change and needs to connect more. Okay, and there were three ways in which the studies in the literature um, did that. First, uh, objects or persons were used as representations, so you could see them as boundary objects if you are familiar with the term. Here you see that in school, uh, receipts, for instance, were used, or photos from home settings, to act actively try to get school uh, home in school or uh, other settings in and also vice versa. So there was one study where they had planners that they intend students to use at home to structure their homework. The other one is that the creation of hybrid practices, also very common, where actors from different in and out of school settings collaborate to provide a new learning experience, often uh, typically facilitated with technology. And the last, with occasional or structural out-of-school visits, we term them. So visits to the museum, to a science park, to an amusement park, but also uh, internships where the out-of-school is structurally involved. Oh yeah, I didn't anticipate this. What I would first like to stress is that these initiatives are really nice. It's nice to look at them and to see what is possible. So uh, nothing but uh, appreciation for what the work that's being done to lay con make connections. But what we mainly recognize implicitly or explicitly is how difficult that it can actually be to make those connections. And we are, could question what we are asking from schools of teachers to do so. So, a first challenge could be to go beyond sugarcoating. So, sugarcoating is uh, trying to wrap uh, content that you might find abstract into a um, more popular or more informal way. We saw this, for instance, we're trying to discuss literacy by using rap music as a vehicle. And why we call this sugarcoating is that often students recognize that the rap was only the layer surrounding it, and that the intention of what is to be learned was actually something else. So 
because, for instance, if they try to use rap music, the teacher did not allow to you to use all words used in rap music, so not the swearing, not the anything. So they recognize it as just a layer. What you also saw here is that students then bring in some things that teachers know more, uh, that students know more about. So teachers also felt sometimes threatened in their expertise. So this is not something that you can just add something to. It really needs to um, go beyond sugarcoating, to use the words on the slide. And there's recognition in the literature already that infecting doesn't really work. Another challenge is simultaneously meeting standards. So here an educator discusses this rap uh, dilemma, and she says, I understand it's really her thing to say it, but I am also accountable to school boards, and it's not possible to change those in all cases. Even though in 50 years it might be in the books as poetry. I would like to see if that's true, but... Third challenge is educationalizing. Where you see with all the visits is that it's very important when you go somewhere else for a museum is that you accompany that with some sort of uh, tools to make connections. So with the example of the cow you saw before, you saw students with the notes, and it's very important to make those connections. But what you often see is that it sort of changes the experience. So maybe you all know from experiences when you went to a museum, you had this sheet, you had to do something, and it was no longer the experience of the museum that you were used to, but it was really educationalized in a sense. So, and then you could start to question if it's really still the, the different practice that you are trying to connect, or if it's something more of an educationalized version of it. And I'll come back to why that's important later on. And then, as for all beautiful initiatives, sustain sustainability is so difficult because resources are scarce, especially time and teacher time. And you often saw first-time initiatives that, uh, given the amount of work being done, you could question if it's really possible to continue those initiatives. And what we said and what we saw is that this really calls into question that the initiatives that you saw were often at the margins of regular practice. So they were allotted to extra school time, to a different building, where there's a more favorable teacher-student teacher ratio. And this led us to conclude that to make these connections, schools need degrees of freedom. They need more freedom than they are normally allotted. And what is difficult here, I think, is that currently there seems to be very little freedom. Because at the same time, we want schools to be accountable and they prove their accountability. So what we're asking from schools and teachers might actually be something of a, I don't know, impossible, I wouldn't say, but well, we, I think we need more recognition for how challenging that can be. I promise to get back to this educationalizing, because also in our study with the app and with the self-defined interests of students, we see how students sometimes react to educators trying to make the connections. So this is a fairly straightforward example of a student that really loves to read, often reports enjoying to read, but then says, I have to read this book for school, I don't like that. I do like reading before going to bed, I don't like this. And this is something you see more often, even in reaction to beautiful science initiatives, where uh, students are afforded a beautiful space where they can interact with science, with animals, with things they find interesting. But it seems to be that some students prefer uh, lack of connection, uh, which is the, f the next intended discontinuity. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. This is something that we didn't expect, that's why we like it so much, um, is that there are di different situations where schools and teachers actually prefer disconnections. A very obvious one is they prefer disconnections in language use, so some words are not used to be used at school, also in uh, dress code. Um, um, And what's interesting is this is also typically physically in after-school uh, settings, where we also are not allowed to do certain things as students, which is intentional. And here it's more the way of behaving. 
But we saw also in the studies that schools and teachers also deliberately disconnect because they think it helps learning. So there was a really nice study of a physical exercise teacher who said, no, I want to change the rules of the games, of the sports, because then all students have the same starting position and then everyone can participate equally. So he really said this disconnect helps all students or the mean student to learn. And we also saw students disconnecting deliberately to participate and to learn. You see this a lot in vocational education and teacher education where students to really participate in the work practice actively disconnect from the teacher education institute or program to temporarily at least forget about all those theories and try to really uh, connect to the work practice. Um, you see it when school is considered a bleak version of the real practice. So when in school you can use your video game for some purpose, but it's not really the same thing as when you can do it at home. Or when your teacher uses your Netflix series to make it, but it's not really the same thing. But also to maintain an image with peers or teachers. And I think this is something most of us are also more familiar with. Not everyone wants to see, seem like the nerd to ask, answer the question, so they also deliberately disconnect. But actually, this raised, this raised more questions than we could answer, because it's often not really delved into why this is the case, why students benefit. So again, we checked in this study, and we asked adolescents to think about the two main things, the two main interests, the two things they'd like to spend most time on. So you can think for yourself, what are the two things that you like to spend most time on? Doesn't matter if it's academic or non-academic. Students answered. And then do you think school knows about these things? And then students could answer on a scale from one to 100. Do your teachers know about this? And one would be very little or no teachers know. And 100 would be all teachers know because this is the most important thing to me and my teachers know who I am, so this is important to me. So again, you can guess for yourself how many interests students or adolescents themselves would say that teachers know about. And for 100 of these interests, students indicated that teachers did not, by no means, zero, know about it. Teach, uh, students' perceptions. I don't know if teachers would agree. Maybe they do know. Teachers sometimes know more than we think. Okay, so... Interesting, we thought we can explore this in more detail. Do you think that students would like teachers to know about these interests? <laughs> no. oh, that's, of course, the leading question. In two of the three cases, indeed, they would, not, they would like them to know less than the zero percent. I don't know how bad, but it's a questionnaire artifact, perhaps. And then what I think is we should take into account, these were not just interests like Netflix or hanging out with my friends, although they were also there, but these also include meditation, believing in God, learning Korean, master programs, so all sorts of things where we would say, actually, it will be very productive for school to know about, and students do not want this. So in a small-scale study, we are looking into, okay, so how do students benefit, and what can we learn about it? In, uh, in this whole uh, environment or society where connection seems to be the most valued thing. Okay, so actors deliberately and productively disconnecting context. So I'm gonna round up. We started with this, and we, I think very early on in the session we um, established that this, according to the literature and our own work, is indeed the case. But I promise some nuances. We also saw that it can be very challenging in terms of sugarcoating content, also meeting standards, not severely educationalizing out of school that it doesn't enrich, and sustainability, for which we need degrees of freedom. We also saw that it can have very unexpected consequences in terms of surprising learning that we didn't expect but also in terms of the counter-reaction, where students do not want teachers to be involved. Um, yeah. Okay, I hope you're with me in that respect. If we think a little bit further, we could also maybe more theoretically say that connecting participations is actually what constitutes learning. 
if you don't look at learning as a vertical process of being from a novice to an expert, but as a horizontal process, as Engelström has argued, of connecting practices, then you could say this is actually what learning is and what we do all the time. We try to build these blocks and then we make, give meaning to what we learn in different settings and different practices. And this is what makes us us. And then you could really ask, okay, but who falls between the cracks? What if school is isolated? What if school is not your place? What if at school you each day get the message that you don't belong? And I think this is something that we should take into account and maybe explore for the outliers in our studies. And then we also saw last that disconnect in participation may also be productive, including for learning. Okay, where does this leave us? I think for school, this is an impossible balance. You don't, on the one hand, you have maybe accountability, on the other hand, you have flexibility, creativity, and they need to make choices. And what I think and what we conclude the review with is that we, although everyone has this critical stance and that current schooling is no good, and of course it's important to be reflective of this institution that we attend from an early age, we think that we really need a nuanced debate and recognition that school cannot be the answer to all our problems. You might agree up front, but I think this is important to stress. Whereas we can be critical of school, we also should take into account the whole picture. Then, future research. Here we see the team that is now working with this app um, and that is actively pursuing more of these questions, which we hope to, of course, tell you about on upcoming earlys. And then I come back to my daughter and uh, her on the beach where she made this boundary in the sand with the recognition that building these beach castles is not the only thing that she's interested in. So each individual participates in multiple contexts, but is also interested in learning multiple things which are nested or uh, in multiple contexts. So in this future research, we don't only want to look at how um, individuals experience continuity and discontinuity across practices, but also how that might be different for different types of learning processes that are uh, rooted in different practices and have different meaning for individuals in terms of the past and in the future. And I also hope to tell you more about that in the future early. And um, thank you for your attention. We have a little bit of time now to have some questions to Larike, who has inspired us so much. I'm afraid the microphone will uh, discontinue to work because the battery is completely empty, but maybe we have the next other one in there. Okay, I can try to repeat the questions as well if, if I can hear them, yeah. So, questions, please. Um. Perhaps I missed it, but um, for in my daughters have this discontinuity uh, towards school in that they treat the school as their world. And they don't really like to talk about it with me. Mm -hmm. Was it in your overview or, or is it an extra? Okay. Could everyone hear that question or not? N no? Okay, so I'll just, so uh, uh, Robert Jan mentioned that his daughters actually um, prefer a different disconnect, namely uh, disconnecting uh, their school life from the parents. Uh, no, I didn't see that uh, in, the, in the articles. We did see that in some of the case studies that we are doing now, that school uh, and also how they behave at school uh, sometimes is preferred to kept separate from parents. Another thing that was, I think was very different is how parents actually are also in school. So there were three, uh, it was a case study of three children that were very silent in, in classes and uh, the teachers didn't really know why. And it was actually because they still had in their thinking the norms of their parents where they were only allowed to speak up if they really knew the answer because that was the norm at home. So you do see that parents are actually also in school, even though they are not there. Just to give an idea, yeah. Thank you for your great talk. It was really inspiring. Uh, my question is about um, trajectories between students when they uh, 
get older. Mm -hmm. Do you see differences in um, how they connect or disconnect to school between young age and adolescents, for instance? Yeah, so we are studying that now we started, sorry, so the question was if we see differences between young and older children and if there maybe changes when they move between educational settings, maybe that's my, so we are studying that now. We started a year ago, a year before students are transitioning to a different setting. Uh, and we are looking at that now because this is the moment where they make this transition. You do see large differences in how uh, students report on what they find interesting or what they engage with, with older students being a lot more specific and knowing a lot more about themselves, I think. Is that sufficiently? So no, you ask for their relation to school as well. Well, I think what you see in uh, what is reflected in the data is that the more time you spend in school and the higher your school level, the more freedom there is to pursue your own interests. So you often see that students like their internship, they like their capstone projects, anywhere where there's more freedom to um, uh, yeah, bring in your own outside worlds. I would say that. And uh, uh, the rest I wouldn't dare to say yet. Ah, okay. uh, oh. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, you can hear me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for a great talk. Um, I would like you to expand a little bit on what you mean by uh, 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 um, connecting participation, constituting learning. In which sense of constituting learning? Is it learning? Is it your definition of learning? Or is it uh, what opens learning possibilities, or is it the transformation? Could you say a little bit more about this word constitution? You did say that you wanted the theory on top, so now I'm yeah. asking you to expand a bit on that. Uh, I, yeah. So I think up front we thought that this was actually what learning is, connecting participations in a horizontal way. And then not necessarily across practices, but connecting um, across time, I would guess. So also on an individual level, you continue a learning process over time and it is informed by multiple practices. So this is actually what learning is. But in the reviewed literature, there was often more the understanding of the connection facilitates learning, and then learning could be measured by some, uh, something else. So it was also a message that maybe we should try to look at it differently and try to see the learning processes going on, where you, when you see the connections, you also already see the different understandings or the nuance or the... Uh, yeah. Does that answer your question, or would you like to comment more on Uh, what I'm saying is, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's too sorry. simple. Yeah, <laughs> is that uh, um, there are many more aspects than just the participation and the connecting of the participation. It, uh, and it also, it uh, if you just define it that way, if you say it is, uh, then you simply close off against asking um, how does participation contribute or, or connecting participation contribute to other aspects because you've just made a definition of learning that way. So I'm saying I'm I'm sort of a bit afraid of saying le that's a, that it just is participation, but it, it, that it contributes in different ways, which would be interesting to explore. Yeah. And w so what do you think that we neglect if we say the connection is the learning? Well, you, you neglect asking questions about cognitive aspects as well, because you're just saying it's a participation. Then there might be interesting questions about what, what's go going on in the minds of uh, the students that they are not... Um, that they're not is not a part of the participation. It will also uh, 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 you will also find it difficult to ask questions about exactly the cracks because you have defined learning as a participation. So what if they do they not learn when they're not participating? Well, I would say that they're learning how to cope with that as well, and they have so so there are many questions that you can't ask if you define learning as participation straight out instead of saying it's part it's participation and 
it, 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 participation is part of what constitutes it. I mean, the ways that you can sort of nuance that and yeah. still have the participation as an important role. Okay. Yeah, so my intention would never be to close off any interesting questions. And I'm not sure if I completely understand what you think I implied and if I did indeed imply that. It was intended for us to think about if learning is only the vertical process of gaining knowledge in a certain practice or if learning is also the, the process of connecting. Yeah, so I didn't mean to close off the other. Uh, okay, of course we are also interested in still how something contributes and builds on, but then across practices and maybe also across objects that we are interested in. Okay, then I miss an instructor. Okay. Thank you for your inspiring presentation. Um, um, you had a, 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 a set of characteristics of in school and out of school was uh, anything that misses one of those characteristics. Now, isn't that a bit unfair to some schools? Because in school can also be a very variable experience. You need not all the characteristics for any school to be there. Okay, so, uh, so uh, you're talking about, we try to make a dialogical distinction between an in and out of school, where we say out of school is also defined by what is in school and vice versa. And you, if I understand you correctly, are saying, am I not doing school injustice because what happens in school is also valuable? Am I correct? Okay, I did not mean to imply that what is happening in school is invaluable, it, by no means. So maybe that uh, I, I try to, yeah. So, and sometimes even if you compare some of the out-of-school initiatives, they are more regulated than in-school practices elsewhere. So this is what we find so difficult to compare and where we came up this list. Some school environments are really uh, where students pursue interests, where there's a lot of freedom, definitely. But over the whole, in-school tends to be more regulated and more in line with those characteristics. But I didn't mean to imply that school is not... I will by no means. <laughs> Sorry for that. Thank you. It was very interesting to be here. Um, can you say uh, something about other ways to assess or uh, observe s maybe the c such connections or disconnection between diff across different contexts? So not only asking the children about it, but also observing it or something else? Yeah, so if I understood you correctly, I'm not sure because I couldn't hear you very well. Are there other ways of trying to establish connections next to asking people about them? Yeah. Yeah. So I think with the app, you can really try to see connections because we don't ask about connections, but you do see that for a single learning process or interest engagement, you see different practices uh, being involved, even though the student doesn't consciously report that. But he's deciding what to put on the app, right? Or she? Yeah, they do, yes. So they do um, uh, report or not report, yes. And what we did on a small scale, because of course it's difficult, is that is that like a multi-site ethnography where we also look at students in school for a week and out of school uh, on different locations and try to see what do they do with who do they talk, do they behave the same, are they engaged in the same way. And I think you can see a lot as well, but then still what students think and how they give meaning to that is very important. But I think that is a nice enrichment, but is of course more time consuming. But yes, definitely. And you can then also ask, I mean, you can also ask other actors. It's nice to also ask parents about what, uh, yes, definitely. Um, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for your great talk. I'm not so, sure where you are. Oh, oh, oh. yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was really intrigued by the finding that you, you found this discontinuity uh, between what the uh, children were, uh, wanted, uh, what they wanted to tell their teachers. So there, there were obviously a lot of things that they did not want to tell their teachers, but they were still very uh, helpful for learning for them. So I was just wondering, from a very pragmatic stance, uh, what could you do to... to uh, 
to break that discontinuity, so to say? What do you think? Uh, interesting question. So I think there's one question before that is um, maybe it's okay if students don't want us as teachers to know about certain aspects of their life. So maybe we should respect them. I think it's a normative question where you can have multiple answers. But I think it's interesting because in education we try to personalize a lot and we try to uh, involve students' interests. And then now we see that students don't want all their interests to be shared. Um, for my own experience, as a teacher, I could say, because I didn't study this, that I do try to explain to students why it's important for me to know certain things about them, because then I can take into account, and then sometimes they are willing to share more. But I would like to also uh, have the possibility of students keeping parts for themselves. You, I think you disagree, maybe, but... <laughs> no, no, I, there were just, I can totally understand, I was kind of... Um I was I kept yeah. thinking about this during your talk. I mean, is the discontinuity is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because on the on the mm. one hand, yeah, you do want to keep uh, the children uh, they have their privacy, so they have their own thoughts. But on the other hand, there was also a student who wanted to learn Korean or something like that. Yeah. Didn't want to tell his teacher or her teacher. So you do want to know those things, perhaps. And how do you? I, I don't know. Do you want to know those things as a teacher or as a school in order to help the students? Yeah. Also, it depends. And what I think is the main message uh, is that discontinuity is not always undesirable, I would say, for schools or teachers and students. And then how we go about with that in education, I think, deserves a whole lot more exploration. So uh, what we try to do in this ERC project is really trace students and also trace interests that are not connected or not shared with schools. So over three years, we try to see what if a student doesn't tell about his Korean? Does it matter? Does he then give different kind of support? Does he then not stop pursuing this interest? So maybe in a few years, we can tell more about how, how this pack plays out for different interests and for different settings and different layers of education. Okay, thank you. Okay. Larika, uh, thank you for your inspiring talk. Uh, I had a, qu a question about exactly the same uh, finding, so it connects uh, hopefully well. Uh, of course, um, you asked them whether the teachers know about this interest, but school is of course not only teachers, but also their peers. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering whether you asked also whether peers did know yep. about it and what then the result is, because I can imagine that there are some interests they don't want to share with teachers because also they don't want their peers to know. Definitely, yeah. So we, uh, we also asked, uh, do your classmates, uh, uh, in Dutch, beautiful English, know about this interest? And it was very different for most, because often they already knew. Um, um, but we didn't ask for each t question why, so I, don't, I can't explain the reasoning. Some things they already did with their classmates, and some things they really wanted to keep for herself. So there was one girl who was interested in meditation, and it helped her with stress and all these things, and she didn't want anyone to know. And she sort of said it was something that she was still exploring, and she didn't really know what, but it's not really clear why this is so important for her to actively not share. So. Um, the student in a case study, she was um, a version of knitting, where I don't know the English word, um, and she did that at home, and she thought that her, her classmates would sort of frown upon or maybe a little bit laugh about it, so that's why she didn't really want to share. But then her grandma said it's also because she still makes mistakes and she only wants to show it when she's better, so I'm not sure. So, maybe in two years. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Larike, for your interesting insights. Uh, I was wondering which age group is using the app now, and if if you expect another age group to give different answers of different results. For example, that younger students like to share more than older ones, or the other way around. Or what are your thoughts about that? Yeah. So um, we started with um, about 700 students starting the app. And there were 14-year-olds. Uh, so I don't know if all of you know this, but education in the Netherlands is stratified. So 14-year-olds in the pre-vocational track uh, to 16-year-old, the youngest in the pre-university track, almost uh, transitioning to university. 
uh, but also those that are almost transitioning from university or uh, senior vocational education to the workforce. They're also using the app. Uh, and well, you see difference in, um, in uh, slang, you see difference in spelling, of course, you see difference in elaboration, uh, you see differences in dropout, uh, you see differences in the use of the phone as an instrument, because for the younger age groups, the phone is something the parents often still control, so it's sometimes taken away from the kids. So you see a lot of more, I don't know, pragmatic, uh, perhaps, differences. And for those that are already transitioning to the work, you see different kind of um, difficulties. You also see differences if you allow students to report at night, you get different uh, interests and substances uh, entering uh, in the app. But I'm not sure if this is what you were interested in. What types of differences were you looking at? Well, I was wondering if uh, younger students are uh, more refer referring to uh, relationships with their parents and their friends and the older ones maybe more to uh, not not uh, so inclined to to share things with you as a researcher or um, well uh, the the differences you just uh, listed are things I I never thought about but still find interesting yeah so I'm I, I'm a little bit hesitant to really make strong claims about the differences I think for each group we see connections with family as being something they find important and they report on. Um, from the theory, you, we would expect that the older you become, the more you identify with certain things, and I do think we see that. So it's the reflections on, uh, are become a little bit more of I am a person who, uh, those sort of things. But I think in general, because all of those are facing an educational transition, they are worried with the future, and they are preoccupied, so they also make a lot of reflections for the future. Um, and then uh, you see those that attend university and maybe come into contact that they actively address us in the app as researchers. So you might find it informative to know that and then they explain. So you also, they, they know that we are the audience, but that's the older ones. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. It's me again. Um, the, um, oh. <laughs> did, you, did you find in your, ref uh, in your review uh, research about what teachers know about the quality of the homework at, uh, that students do at home and, and how much help they get at home. Let me, in, I, I always yeah. say to, to schools, uh, I, I think you don't know enough about it. And then they say, no, we know. But I, I didn't find any research on it, did you? Well, um, so I'm struggling because of the number of studies and the time since. Uh, we, I do know that schools try to interfere with how students do their homework. So there was this one study where they had these planners and they tried to have parents do that according so that it was equal at home. So how much teachers know about how students do their homework? How much help they get? No, the studies that we do, that you see, I think, are more uh, ethnographies showing how the help at home differs greatly and students reporting on how their parents, having a different educational experience, cannot help them with homework, don't value the homework, don't create a space for them to do homework. But not so much, I think, of teachers knowing how... There is some about teachers, how much they know about students, but not about how they help with... I didn't see it, I think. I will try to look. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, um, thank you for a great uh, presentation. Um, one thing that I that crossed my mind during your presentation, um, in connection to uh, discontinuity, intended or unintended, um, was the study by Paul Willis uh, about the lads and the counter uh, the counter school culture. And the thing that he uh, uh, made clear, f for me at last, at least, was that um, uh, in every connection or in every disconnection, there's also a connection involved. So he is the one who says culture knows better. These lads came from uh, working class backgrounds and disconnected. 
uh, unintended or intended from the, the school culture. And uh, the, the stance that Willis takes is that this prepares them to go to connect to working class culture. So it's, it's, it's not disconnection or uh, discontinuity or continuity, but a kind of discontinuity that prepares you for different uh, continuities further on in your life. Is this also something like the societal effects or the uh, inequality effects that you will pursue in your, in your studies? Or, uh, because up to now it looks at me, to me as we have all kinds of different beautiful ways of connecting and disconnecting and so on, mm -hmm. but they have real consequences. So is it, yeah, some, con yes. is it something that you are engaging in further on? Or? Uh, um, thank you for this uh, comment. Uh, so it may, let me start first by you, I think, beautifully illustrated how disconnecting from school means connecting in other ways. And I think that's, that is the case, definitely. And what we try to do in our research is take this open perspective where we centralize the individual and all of his participations. But what we did here is we had to fixate something. You have to make something fixed so that you can analyze it. So that's why we only looked at the school and that connection. But of course, there are a variety of other connections that are important and consequential. So just to illustrate that we didn't look at it now, but I do realize that it is part of what individuals experience. And then, yes, we do intend to look at the consequences of disconnecting and connecting, and also for different groups or different uh, participations, yes. And then um, what is difficult is that I, my expectation would be that for some students, seeing as how we approach them via school, the research might be part of what they consider school, so if they really do disconnect, we might also lose track of them. And we see that already happening and we try to still involve them by still asking them to do then do the interview because the filling in the app is a lot of work also if you're already busy with other more important things so we do try to still include them and also see the cases where you might think it's more important even the connection yes but uh, yeah you will, maybe you know how difficult yeah, yeah. uh yeah oh Jan. hi Larik. hi uh, thank you for your talk and uh, for showing the progress you've made during the last decade. Um, I, I have a question. Now, now the discussion is moving towards culture. Uh, I, I got the impression that if you do a review study, of course, you see especially uh, the North American, Western European, Australian examples. Mm -hmm. um, and especially here, I wonder whether there are examples from totally different cultures, actually, how uh, the world of school and out of school interact and how, how those connections are made. And maybe they are not part of your review, but you came across interesting literature that didn't comply with the empirical standards, etc., that you have examples of. Yeah, so uh, the question was, reviews you tend to end up, especially if you look for English literature with uh, research that's been conducted in Anglo-Saxon countries. That was indeed the case. There were some other countries involved. Um, your question was if they present a different picture, I think. Different. So I don't think, I didn't come across something, I should say, that, that it was completely different. The tension was not completely different, I think. I have to think about, I think the problems that they try to address are different. So there was a, uh, a different study about substance abuse from a different country, for instance. There was a study tracing how often mothers carried their child on their back and how that interfered or not interfered with child's uh, spatial abilities. So things that we might not immediately think of to study uh, in certain countries or cultures. But I think the findings, I, we didn't find the findings to be that different. So I think we could integrate them. And maybe that's different if we find more studies. Uh, if we would uh, have different search terms. Um, do you think we should? Yeah.
Yeah. The, oh, there was one comparative study, now that you mentioned this, it helps my memory to make a connection, uh, where they compared ch American children with children in, I think it was South Korea, I'm not sure, and how much time they spent on homework out of school and how much that uh, helped their grades. And there were different norms in different countries about how much time spending on homework is still um, acceptable or productive or how it was valued but not necessarily a difference in the connection. Where you could even argue that homework is still part of school, of course. But yeah. Thanks. Hi. Hi. <laughs> you know, I'm a big fan of your work and, and of boundary crossing. Um, at a certain point in your, um, your presentation, you talked about uh, good boundary crossers. Um, ah, yeah. In, when referring to, yeah. to uh, given continuity, do your studies enlighten already uh, some characteristics of those boundary crosses? Um, what are they able to do? No, yeah, so I think there was one of the studies that really coins the term uh, boundary crossing competence as an individual characteristic. I think that we would definitely say it's something of the individual in relation to the practices where he or she is in. So you saw in some cases that students with a different language than used at school were really able to profit from it and they had this different meaning and they, they could, yeah, they could take uh, profit from crossing boundaries and in some cases not. And it seemed to be also that these, the whole system around it or the practice around it are really influential. So for, uh, uh, we didn't see any personal characteristics. There seems to be a sort of tolerance for insecurity, but I think it comes with this, the practices that someone is in. So it's something that in the interaction of those two or in the together, I think, would make a good boundary crosser. Um, that's what we are thinking of now, at least. So it's not, but because even when practices are similar and you would think that, oh, okay, so everyone crosses easily, there are still some that have difficulties. So it's, the, it's both, I think. Um, but no, we didn't um, encounter um, more characteristics of individuals. So I was actually hoping that your work would... Uh, <laughs> maybe <laughs> finally, yes. Okay. Well, maybe... Uh, <laughs> we have time for maybe one, two questions more. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. My question relates to the notion of interest and the way you use uh -huh. the notion of Surprisingly, interest. Surprisingly, in yeah. <laughs> so I was wondering whether or not in any of your studies or in any of the studies you kind of uh, reviewed, whether or not, the, for example, the robustness of the interest impacted wi which contexts or how many co different contexts were relevant for that particular learner. Because you could easily think that, you know, for someone who has a very, let's say, situated interest or a, a, um, you know, a situated interest in something like farm animals, it doesn't really connect anywhere else except the farm. Yeah. But when it develops into a more personal or robust interest, he or she or they become, uh, begun, be, uh, start to see different connections or different connections to that interest in other settings as well. Yeah. Uh, so fascinating question. Um, I have to say, again, this is something that we are now exploring. So we are, there are a few studies that compare different interests that an individual has. So when you are then comparing interests, you're actually also comparing persons and you are comparing complete practices. So what we are now doing is comparing uh, interest and Salna and Thea are working on um, a conceptualization of interest practices and how you can try to define the amount of institutionalization, um, uh, cultural embeddedness, materialization, and then uh, given those, try to compare across interests to see how much it matters, how many uh, materials you need for your interest, how much it is embedded, but also how much parents actually support or push back, uh, and that in relation to the personal objectives that someone has with the interests, so, because we think that all are important. So the support of context, the embeddedness of the interest in different ways, I can talk more about it later, but also the goals that someone has, and then we try to explain why some pursuits are stronger or live, and some uh, 
transform or die. Yeah. So not yet, but uh, hopefully yes. <laughs> Thank you once again so much and also very for very good questions. Uh, we need to go to the next session, so thank yeah. you. <laughs>